Uh, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, welcome to this, uh, this talk, and I'm really thankful to Indian Institute of Science Education and Research and the Science Activity Center here for giving me this opportunity uh, to um, talk on National Science Day. It's my first first time doing this, and I'm very excited. Uh, so um, I, I'm an assistant professor of mathematics here, and I work in probability and I work in combinatorics. So together, I'm often referred to as a discrete probabilist. So I won't be talking about probability in this particular talk, but I thought it would be really nice uh, to sort of introduce you guys to um, problems that my parents uh, you know, gave to me to, to sort of ponder over when I used to be in my seventh, eighth grades. It was, um, uh, they're, they're more like puzzles, you know, and they're, they're, they're supposed to fascinate you, supposed to keep you engaged. Uh, and this is how they, you know, they sort of wanted me to, uh, you know, sort of fall in love with mathematics. And uh, I mean, I was doing mathematics as a, or, I mean, as, as a school curriculum, but this is beyond that. Uh, this is, um, so I, I thought that it would be nice to sort of also start, because I guess most of you are high school students, so uh, start with you guys in the same manner, you know, talk about problems that uh, used to keep me uh, engaged for hours on end uh, when I was a high school student. So, uh, and as the title suggests, it's colors in mathematics. So I hope you all love colors and it's, it's going to be a lot of coloring happening that, that mingles with uh, mathematical arguments. Okay, so I will uh, plunge right in. Uh, so as the title of this talk suggests, so there will be colors involved in mathematical problems. So, um, so we start with uh, a typical chessboard. It's an 8x8 chessboard. Probably most of you have seen a chessboard. Um, and it's colored like this, you know, it's, it's colored uh, using this alternative black and white squares. And then the idea is that you are given a bunch of dominoes. Now dominoes, so maybe most of you have also um, played with jigsaw puzzles. You can think of these dominoes as the little pieces in the jigsaw puzzles. Uh, so each domino uh, is so this two by one uh, piece where you have two squares that are with one side, one side glued to each other, and uh, the the each square of the domino is congruent to each small square of the chessboard. So, uh, if you're looking at this particular domino here, so each of these uh, two squares uh, is congruent to each of the black and white squares of the chessboard. Okay, so now uh, when we talk about covering uh, the chessboard with these dominoes. So first of all, uh, there are a couple of rules, and I also mentioned this later on in one of the slides. Uh, the rules are that when you place the dominoes, it cannot be the case that two dominoes overlap. It cannot be the case that uh, there, there are two dominoes that you have placed, uh, like an L, for example. Then, then you know, the one square of this domino will, will uh, overlap with one square of the, of the other domino. So you cannot have such a situation. So dominoes must not overlap with each other and dominoes must not protrude outside of the board. So it cannot be that uh, you have a domino that such that it's, um, it's placed in one corner of the chessboard and um, one of its squares is on the chessboard, the other square is hanging outside the chessboard. This is also not allowed. So dominoes must be contained entirely inside the chessboard and two do no two dominoes can overlap with each other. Okay, so given this, uh, these, two, these two rules, um, you have in an 8 by 8 chessboard, you have 64 squares and each domino comprises two squares. So you would require 32 dominoes to cover the chessboard. Okay, so that's what I uh, right in the first slide that um, you can and, and you know this is a whole different uh, uh, world of questions if you ask how many ways are there to place the dominoes so that so that they cover uh, the chessboard this is another you know whole universe of questions I shouldn't even say a world it's a whole universe of uh, amazing questions most of which actually remain unanswered okay so you can place a domino 
uh, horizontally, you can place a domino vertically, uh, but you cannot place the domino in any other way because if you place it in any other angle, then uh, its squares will not coincide with two squares of the of the chessboard. So you must keep that in mind as well. So, but you know, since there is the, this option of either vertical placement or horizontal place, placement, that's why it makes sense to ask: Okay, how many ways are there that you can cover the the chessboard with the, with thirty two dominoes? But we are going to go into the, this, this, you know, counting the number of ways in which you can cover the chessboard with dominoes. That comes uh, under the purview of uh, combinatorics, which is a, you know, it's a very vast and very intriguing subject uh, topic in mathematics. But we will talk about something else now. So let's move on to the next slide. So this chessboard is a broken chessboard. It's slightly different in the sense that you have chosen any two black squares from the chessboard and you have removed them, you have cut them out. Okay, so I've denoted that using this red color. So red means that they're simply not there anymore. Okay, uh, or you can color them red as well. That's also allowed. Um, you, can, you can do this with any two black squares or you can do this with any two white squares as well. And it doesn't matter where you, which two black squares you cut out from the board. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. You can do, you can, you can choose any two of them and cut them out or paint them red and, and put them off limits. Now, there are, so previously there were 64 squares on the chessboard, now two are gone, so you have 62 squares on the chessboard. And now the question is, so you would need 31 dominoes if you were to try and perfectly cover this broken chessboard. The question is, can you cover this broken chessboard with 31 dominoes? 31 should be enough. Because again, you cannot have overlapping dominoes and you cannot have dominoes protruding outside of, the, of this chessboard. But is, uh, is it possible at all to cover this, this broken chessboard using 31 dominoes? Again, keep in mind you are either placing the dominoes like each domino you're placing either horizontally or vertically. Okay, um, because I mean, if you if you don't place them in, in, in such a manner, again, the squares of dominoes will not um, coincide with the squares of the chessboard. Uh, so that's not an a not not an acceptable um, position. Okay, okay. Now I'll tell you why you actually cannot uh, cover this broken chessboard using uh, thirty one dominoes. Okay. So the idea is the following, and this is where coloring plays such a crucial role. Um, so the first couple of bullet points, I just, I just mentioned the rules that we must observe, that, that must be maintained when you are covering the, the, the broken chessboard uh, with the dominoes. But the thing is, when you are placing a domino, whether you place it horizontally or vertically, it will cover one black and one white square. So just going back one more time, to this broken chessboard or the original chessboard, whichever you like. You just, just look at this. Because you have this alternative pattern of black and white, so if you put the domino in a horizontal position, you will cover one black, one white, or one white, one black square. Or if you put it in a vertical position, you would have one white, one black, or one black, one white, covered by the domino. However, in the broken chessboard, since you have removed uh, two black squares, Okay, so now you have 32 white squares and 31, uh, sorry, I 30, 30 black squares. Okay, 32 white and 30 black squares. So if you now try covering this broken board with 31 dominoes, those 31 dominoes would require 31 black squares and 31 white squares. So you cannot cover a, a broken board that has 32 white and 30 black squares with, with 31 dominoes. So you see, we're not we're not sitting down and trying different kinds of coverings to see whether you know one of them will satisfy you know uh, this this the conditions of perfect covering. What we are doing is coming up with a clever coloring. So in this case, the the chessboard is already colored, but there are many other problems where you have to come up with the coloring to see uh, what's going on and to see that. Um, the, the coloring itself provides you the solution that no, this is not possible. So usually this sort of coloring um, problems help you answer questions in the negative. Because if you do have a covering possible, 
a perfect covering of, of the of the chessboard possible with dominoes or trominoes or whatever you know blocks you're looking at. Then of course you know then comes the question of counting the number of possible coverings and all that. But clever colorings would usually tell you when such a perfect covering is not possible. Okay, so this is one of those uh, examples. Okay, so I'll look at one final example, which is kind of different from different in flavor from what we have seen so far. Uh, and uh, in this example, I also I, I try to introduce uh, you guys for for those of you who haven't already seen this to a couple of notions. The first one is that of graphs, and of course, then you will say, but I I know what what a graph is. It's a graph of a function. We we plot graphs on these you know these. Uh, papers, these special graph papers for, for our school exams and stuff like that. This is a different kind of graph. Um, and um, that's the first topic that I sort of try to give you uh, an introduction to. And the second one is um, uh, to this amazing vast theory that's known as um, Ramsey theory. You start, you just take a piece of paper and you, and you draw six points on, on, on the paper. And no three of them are collinear, meaning you you don't want to draw them in such a manner that you can draw a straight line through three of them. I mean, even if you do it, it doesn't really uh, make a lot of difference in the argument, but it's easier to visualize what's going on when you don't draw them in a collinear fashion. Okay, so now <laughs> what you do is after you've drawn the, the, the points, you connect every two of them uh, using a straight line. So that's basically what I have shown in this diagram. So you have the points, you have named the points, you can name them in some other way. I named them A, B, C, D, E, F. And then I have joined every pair of points using a straight line. Now, this sort of um, structure is known as a graph, uh, where the, the points that you have drawn and are known as vertices of the graph or nodes of the graph. And these straight lines that connect uh, two vertices, these are known as edges of the graph. Okay, and this is a, is a very useful way of representing many, many, many models. So maybe most of you are on social media and uh, you can think of this whole uh, structure of social media as a graph where you all are vertices and your friendships are edges. Okay, so that's one way of representing um, something very complicated as social media networks um, uh, by graphs. Okay, so graphs are a very, very useful tool that we make use of in pretty much every branch of mathematics. So now we will talk about coloring this graph. So that's what we are getting to next. And what we want to do is we want to take every edge of the graph. Okay, and, and assign it either the color blue or the color red. And you do it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm doing it. You sit down with the graph and you color it in whatever way you like, as long as you stick to two colors, okay? And so again, you're just taking every edge of the graph and you're assigning either the color blue to it or the color red to it. Just, just you know, you, uh, you can do this that you and your friend decide to color the graph in, in your own ways, you know, and still I would be able to find either a blue triangle or a red triangle in your coloring and a blue a triangle or a red triangle in, in your friend's coloring. So yeah, so this, um, this is like, you know, I know, I know this, this sounds very weird, but, you know, however we colored the graph, we'd still be able to guarantee this. And this is where, this is why, you know, it really became a theory that, you know, yes, this is, this is possible. And so how do you, how do you go about arguing this? So there is, in fact, in this uh, argument, I didn't mention it because it's a lot of terms, new terms. I didn't want to like get you all confused. But when you listen to the video, maybe you can uh, you can look this up on your own. But there is another underlying principle that gets used in the argument. It's called the pigeonhole principle. Pigeonhole principle. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who love birds, and this must be exciting for you, so you can actually look up what a pigeonhole principle stands for. So, but not going into the technical terms uh, that are involved, let's just start the argument, you know. So let's, let's look at the vertex, um, um, vertex A. Uh, so in this, I'm just going back uh, to the previous slide. So look at the vertex A. So how many edges are going out of A, are emanating out of A, radiating out of A? So there is AB, there is AC, there is AD, AE, and AF, okay? 
So there are five edges that are radiating out of, of the vertex A. Whatever coloring you choose to assign to these edges, it has to be the case that three of these edges have the same color, at least three of them. Why? Because if not, then you will end up with, let's say you have precisely two edges out of these five edges, which are blue, and precisely two edges out of these five edges, which are red. But two plus two is four. So what's the fifth edge gonna be? It has to be either red or blue. So that tells you that uh, out of five, out, out of these five edges, at least three have to be of the same color, okay? And since the argument uh, would be the same no matter which three you choose, let's just say that AB, AC, and AD are of the same color, and let's say this color is blue. So that's what I write here. So let's say that AB, AC, and AD, these are the blue uh, edges. I mean, you could also make them red. You could say that, no, I, I would prefer ABA and AF to be of the same color. It's also fine. But the argument stays the same no matter which three you choose and which color, which common color you assign to these three. Okay, so the argument will stay the same. Um, so now notice that if you have at least one of the edges, BC, BD and CD blue, then you have yourself a blue triangle. Okay, so that's what I point out in these diagrams. Let's say that BC is blue, then since AB and AC are both blue, you would have uh, the blue triangle ABC. In the second diagram you see, uh, since, uh, so let's say BD is blue now, so then since AB and AD are both blue, so you have the blue triangle ABD. And in the third picture you see here, let's say CD is blue, then since AC and AD were blue to begin with, so then you have ACD, your blue triangle. So you, you see, you've seen that. So what have we seen so far? We have seen that starting, so looking at the vertex A and looking at all the edges that are coming out of the vertex A, there are five of them. And because there are two colors, and there are five edges that we're looking at right now. So at least three of these edges have to be of the same color. Let's say those are A, B, A, C, and A, D, and let's say the common color that they have is blue. If at least one of the edges B, C, B, D, and C, D uh, is blue, then you have a blue triangle for sure. So what is the only possibility left now? That none of B, C, B, D, and C, D is blue. So then, you have BC, BD, and CD all red. They're all red because blue, if they're not blue, then they have to be red. But then they form a triangle, and this is your red triangle. You have the triangle BCD, which is completely red. So as I said, I can guarantee you that you, whatever you're coloring, you will have either a blue triangle or a red triangle. This argument, could you could you could do this starting from any other vertex, doesn't have to be A. You could look at any other edge combination that are where, you know, let's say you start with C and you look at the edges going out of C and let's say you say that, okay, CA, CE and CF are all red in color. Then you could argue again the same along the same lines that you, you would either have a, a red triangle or a blue triangle. So you can play around with these arguments and see, you know, how... Uh, whether you are convinced that this is really what's going on. So these are all the examples that I wanted to show you, but I also wanted to show you that instead of six points, if you start with five points, you can actually guarantee that, uh, you can actually color, in a, not guarantee, you can actually color the five vertex graph in a clever manner such that you do not have a red triangle and you do not have a blue triangle. So once again, the idea is that you take a piece of paper, you draw five points on, on, the, on the paper such that no three of them are collinear, and you again draw straight lines connecting these uh, every pair of these points. And then you assign either, so you take every edge of this graph. So this is also a graph, it's a five vertex graph and you color every edge, either blue or red. Again, it's up to you how you color. Uh, but in this case, I cannot actually guarantee that, oh yeah, no matter what your coloring is, you will end up with either a blue triangle or a red triangle. And I just show you this coloring here in, in this slide, that in this particular uh, coloring, you actually 
have any triangle that you look at, it's it's mixed. It's um, it has either one red side, one red side, and two blue sides, or it has uh, two red sides and one blue side. Okay, so that tells you that for five vertex graphs, this 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 claim fails. So um, I just wanted to say that so the first couple of examples that we looked at, those come under the purview of covering problems or packing problems. And these are uh, very, like, it's again, a very vast area of mathematics that not much is known about it. And uh, usually there aren't general methods that apply to every problem in, in this area. So it's a but, but, but it's an area that's worth delving into. So whoever is interested, like, please, uh, we need people to take up the mantle and like sort of continue the journey. The second, um, the, the third example that we looked at is, as I say, this is a, this is sort of the first example that you see when you're trying to get into this area called Ramsey theory, which was propounded by the British mathematician Frank Ramsey. Um, and again, this is a, a whole wide area. Very little is known. I mean, um, the moment you so here we were looking at triangles, but you could you could talk about um, you know complete graphs, whatever complete graphs mean of, of larger sizes and immediately, you know, most things are not known um, except via, you know, computer programming, but analytically sitting down and working things out, very little is known. So again, something that is worth pondering about. Um, the book that I would suggest, but this is not really a book where that, that you know, fifth, sixth graders can just plunge into. Um, unless you're, you know, unless you've already been exposed to this sort of mathematics, but it's definitely suitable for, um, you know, people in in the tenth, eleventh, twelfth grades uh, of high school to sort of start looking at this book. It's a, uh, it's fun. You don't have to take it up as like a, it shouldn't create pressure for you. It should be like it's something that you know is, uh, makes you feel happy to to, to go through the book. And this book is called Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur Angel. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, it's a it's a book that you can it's it's available online. It's available. I think there are this Indian subcontinent editions available as well. There are many other kinds of books uh, as well that you can uh, uh, take a look at. Um, again, they are quite advanced, but the idea is that you sit down and you look at the preliminary examples and you get intrigued, you get fascinated and you, you start enjoying yourself. And then, you know, if at some point you face like, okay, you feel like okay, this is a little too difficult for me, just stop for, for the time being. Or you can ask for help or you can talk to your friends and maybe you guys can form a group and figure it out. A um, couple other books I will just sort of mention in, in, in passing. Uh, there is um, a, a walk through combinatorics and a path to combinatorics. Those are very amazing books as well, very rich, um, teaches you a lot of stuff. Um, I learned a lot uh, from them. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Um, I hope that this was um, this was a fun session for you guys. Mathematics is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's nothing to be ever intimidated by. Uh, of course, I mean, Every subject is hard in its own way. Every subject, that's, that's I mean, whether you're studying mathematics or music, it doesn't matter. Um, you, but the point is how much you love it. And that's all that, that should really matter. If you really love it, you just go forward with it. And here's, you know, just, you know, people like me who are just trying to um, help you fall in love with the subjects that we love, you know. Uh, yeah, so here's a fun slide for you guys to, to bid you goodbye uh, for this year and hopefully I can come back next year and uh, talk more about uh, colorings and other fun stuff in mathematics.